Our show is now on Stitcher. Listen to us on your iPhone, Android phone, Kindle Fire, and other devices with Stitcher. Stitcher is smart radio for your phone. Find it in your app store or on Stitcher.com. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Pray with me, if you will. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come with the fire and burn. Come with the rain and cleanse. Come with the wind and breathe. Come with the light and reveal. Convict us, convert us, consecrate us. Claim and call us with your care and concern, O God, until we do something. Amen. Amen. Scholars tell us that in the midst of uh, Corinth, Paul explains his message and ministry, uh, not overly defensively, but just he feels the need to explain because there's this conflict and a little bit of confrontation between the people of Corinth and our brother Paul. The lesson builds on previous sections of the letter which spoke of the hope and of the enduring new covenant and the boldness instilled instilled in believers of God's transformative power. Having stated in 4, 1 and 2, which Keith just read for us, what he does not do and what he does and why. Paul is saying that the claims of those who oppose him are the evidence of their spiritual lacking. Paul explains the lack of perception or appreciation as resulting from the work of the God of this age. In other words, Satan blinds the believers. This explanation is, Paul's, is part of Paul's worldview of apocalyptic dualism. For those of us in the 20th century, it means that Paul takes the struggle between God and evil with utmost seriousness. Thus, he understands that God's work in this world for the salvation of humankind is a costly, difficult endeavor. In verses 5 and 6, Paul states that he does not consider himself an appropriate subject for Christian proclamation. Rather, he preaches Christ as Lord. Paul locates himself in what he declares to be an appropriate Christian role, namely in service to other believers for the sake of Jesus. He shows that holding Jesus high means that one's interest in others will be greater than in one's self. This text is an urgent plea to look at the life of Jesus as the mark of a calling to live towards the life of Jesus. Paul believed in putting others first instead of himself. And he claims that this is a call for any believer. We most clearly love God when we follow Jesus. Dr. Jordan Pelican of Yale University wrote a remarkable study of the significance of the work of Jesus, Jesus through the centuries. Dr. Pelican demonstrates how Jesus has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture. Each age has made Jesus relevant to its own needs. Jesus has furnished each new age with answers to fundamental questions of every generation. And every generation has more fundamental questions of human existence and how we might meet that in the way of Jesus. The world had to take, had to take a look at Jesus as rabbi, as the cosmic Christ, as the ruler of the world, as king of kings, as prince of peace, the son of man, the true image of man, the great liberator. In other ways, Jesus furnished the answers and the images that afflicted society in positive ways. Dr. Pelican's thesis is that Jesus did not and does not belong to the churches and theologians alone. Jesus belongs to the world. None of this is to say that we can make Jesus what we want Jesus to be, quite the opposite. 
It is to say that the Christ is adequate for all our needs and that Jesus transcends culture in such a way that he is able to belong to each age and to address the issues of all time. To understand that we can know better than look to the Holy Gospel for today, which celebrates the transfiguration of our Lord. In that momentous event, we learn how and why Jesus belongs to the centuries. Paul is hard on people. He cajoles, he comforts, he harangues, he tells them that they're not even fit for spiritual food. They must drink milk rather than meat. He is this harsh because he himself was stubborn. He persecuted the early church, and it wasn't until encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus, literally and spiritually struck blind, that he came to know what it means to follow Jesus. Frederick Beekner says it this way, um, in wishful thinking. I'm, this is now 42 years old. I'm really surprised. I've loved this text. What is both good and new about the good news is that the wild claim that Jesus did not simply tell us that God loves us even in our wickedness and folly and wants us to love each other the same way and to love him too or that if we would let him, God will actually bring about this unprecedented transformation in our hearts. God will do this for us. Patty really set the stage in terms of saying, do you, do you send valentines to people who don't like you, to people who mistreat you, who, to, to people who lie about you? Oh, yes, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. I do that. No, I don't. I try to be civil. But I'm one of those Christians that, you know, Jesus turned the other cheek. You hit me once and prepare for me to hit you the, the next time you strike me. I know who I am. It's hard when you're mistreated. I saw the movie Selma. I'm... I have no investment in it other than I like the film and I recommend it to you. My wife and I talked about it afterwards and I recalled that I was 15 when the march from Selma to Montgomery took place. And I really had no idea until 2003 when Ken Ellis and myself and my wife and about 16 other people were there to rebuild, I think it's Sand Ridge Baptist Church, about five miles out of the city. It was a victim of arson. This doesn't make headlines because it's really not sexy. But about between 14 and 20 houses of worship are burned every month in the United States alone. Think of that, 14 to 20. There we were in Selma, and I will tell you that when we've been on nine or ten of these trips, usually whoever's in town welcomes us. I will tell you that the big hardware store that we used for supplies in Selma, not so welcoming. They let us know in the way they treated us that they weren't real happy that we were there. That's not to say everyone. We lost our place where we were we're going to uh, stay in a Methodist church that was conflicted, I, I am told, about whether to allow arson rebuilders stay there. So a man of another denomination, I recall his name to be Jerry Patterson, he was a contractor and he had uh, some property and he let us stay in one of his properties. And he treated us with such dignity. He was uh, born and raised in Selma and a true, true man of peace, so caring and kind.
One evening at, uh, for the evening Bible study, Reverend Rich Garner, who was the spiritual leader on this trip, took us to Brown's Chapel in Selma, which was the place from which Dr. King and the others marched. And he read from an account, and then we walked to the Edmund Pettus Bridge and up and over, and as we crested the, the bridge and started down, he read, now it's time to retreat. And they did, and this reenacted part of the movie. And, and I will tell you, as we left Brown's Chapel, it was dark. It was probably 8.30, maybe even 9. And as we left, a police officer rolled up and said, don't you know that it's a bit dangerous in this part of town? And we were naive and did not know. He said, I'm going to escort you to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and how long before you expect to get back? And we told him. And as we came back, he escorted us back to our cars, which were parked in front of Brown's Chapel. I know what you're thinking. The police officer was a large African-American man, so concerned for our safety. Ken and I were talking, and he said, are you going to talk about Deacon Carter? And how could I not talk about Deacon Carter? Deacon Carter had the thickest of wonderful accents. Whoever I was standing next to when he was talking to me, I said, did you understand what he said? No, we didn't understand what he said. And, and then when he prayed, it was with such articulation and clarity he wanted to be sure God was listening, and I'm sure God was. I got the, I still am tickled that as we left, he said, Reverend, you're a good man, but you have a terrible accent. And he's right. In Amer only in America can that be true. Our then Bishop Marianne Swenson uh, was a comfort to Deacon Carter, who mother, whose mother had died. And he, she wrote in the baptismal book, every time you see my signature, you're going to remember your mother and remember her love for you and how much she loved God. Ken and I were privileged to be among those who were allowed to dig Deacon Carter's mother's grave. Somebody said to us later, do you realize you're probably the only white person they've ever had dig a grave in their church cemetery. I, I hadn't even thought of it. I just, I was overcome by the spiritual nature of it. Ken and I went back and um, along with um, Rick Ewell's wife, Susan, back for the opening of this house of worship. And it was moving and touching and just wonderful. That's one of the things I hope I never forget. And then a couple of years later, I heard a story that I'd never heard about the church of my upbringing. Dr. Robert Washer, I, I think he was a classmate of Dr. King's at uh, Boston Theological School. He heeded the call of Dr. King to come to Selma when all those thousands went there to march. He took his vacation time, his own vacation time, paid for it with his own money, and went back and marched. And when he came back, the head of the trustees had chained all of the doors of the church. So he could not get in. So outraged the head of trustees was at what Dr. Washer had done. Now, I'd like to tell you that I'm from Texas or some other part of this country. But I, was, I wasn't born there, but I was raised in Central Orange County, and the church I'm talking about is Garden Grove United Methodist Church.
The last time I mentioned Dr. King in a service, I also mentioned Bobby and John F. Kennedy. And a person who shall remain nameless came out and said, hmm, you mentioned three uh, men who cheated on their wives. And I thought, did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? And obviously the person didn't. Just thought to jump to judgment rather than grace. The long and short version of the work of God is this. Pick anybody you want to pick aside from Jesus in what we call the Bible. Abraham didn't want to go laughed at the notion of, of God promising him children. Moses killed someone. King David, the greatest king probably in the history of Israel, a reprobate at best. Our brother Paul, I've just told you, bad guy. God chooses those whom we would not hire to clean our bathrooms to lead the church triumphant forward. That's who God is. I don't know who you are and I'm not sure who I am, but I know who God is. Several people sent me a, a wonderful uh, email and if you're one of them, I'm, I'm going to give uh, credit though to Mikio Matsubayashi, who gave it to my sister, my sister's longtime love, who gave it to her, and then she forwarded it to me. Uh, it was dated January 2nd. Most of it still applies. Imagine there, that there is a bank that credits your account with $86,400 every single morning for your personal use. 86400 You wake up and $86,400 is in the bank. However, it has some caveats. You have to spend it, all of it, every day. No exceptions. Every penny not spent each day will be taken from you. And you cannot simply transfer the money to another bank account. It car carries over no balance from one day to the next. And every evening, the bank deletes whatever part of the balance you failed to use throughout the day. Moreover, the bank can stop depositing money in your account or close the account at any time. What would you do? What or who would you spend your money on? Each of us has a bank account like this one. It's called time. There are 86,400 seconds in a day. Every morning you are credited with 86,400 seconds. And every night, each second that has not been invested in a good purpose is written off as a loss. If you fail to utilize the day's deposit, the loss is yours. Each morning the account is refilled, but the bank can dissolve the account anytime without warning. You must live in the present on today's deposit. Investing your seconds wisely will get the most health, happiness, and success out of them. There are 31,536,000 seconds in 2015. 31 and a half million seconds that can be spent to the fullest or lost. Consider everything that can be accomplished with these seconds, all the experience to be had and the memories to be cherished. How will you invest your hours? What will you choose to spend your daily 86,400 seconds on? Well, my friends, that's food for thought with our busy lives, hectic schedules, and the constant tug of war on our time. I hope you find good uses for your gift of 86,400 seconds each day. The long and short of it is, what are you gonna do with your time? 
You're going to spend it beating up on people, being mean and ugly and nasty. You're going to try to be a little more graceful, a little more transformed by the love of God in Christ. What are you going to do? Amen. Thank you for listening to the First United Methodist Church podcast, which is recorded live every week at 4832 Tahunga Avenue in North Hollywood, California, and delivered by Dr. Joey McDonald. For more info on us, please check out nohofumc.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter under nohofumc. Thank you.